Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Holman. I'm pastor here at Kirkville United Methodist Church. I'm joined with a, a couple friends for our study for this Wednesday afternoon. And uh, we apologize for the quality of the sound or lack of quality of the sound from last week's broadcast. We had some a little bit of difficulty. You can still hear it and still follow it, but it just wasn't comfortable. We hope that we've worked out those bugs and that uh, you can hear us clearly and, and see us clearly and follow along with us. Today what we're doing um, is continuing the study that we began uh, the other week, which was on the resurrection appearances of Jesus. And so we looked at uh, uh, those resurrection appearances as they were described in both Matthew and Mark and Luke and a little bit of John. But today we're going to be focusing particularly upon John's gospel and that is found in John chapter 20. We'll notice that there are similarities between the accounts of the resurrection. Most, uh, most simil similar uh, descriptions uh, with a few nuances or a few differences um, that can be accounted for by uh, memory, um, by intention, uh, particularly with intention. Each gospel writer had a particular audience which they were writing to. And so that also went to shape uh, what uh, the descriptions of the resurrection that they wanted to provide. So also with the Gospel of John. Uh, this is the Gospel of John is written later than Matthew, Mark, or Luke. It is uh, supposedly by tradition that uh, we would expect that uh, the, uh, John is the apostle uh, who was a young man when he walked along with Jesus but that now um, at the writing of this he was in his late 80s or even early 90s and so he had a particular um, reason for writing uh, and it was a letter that was circulated uh, through the churches of Turkey and um, giving them some instruction and um, also lifting up um, an argument against the prevailing heresy at the time, which was Gnosticism. And one of the ingredients of Gnosticism, a heresy that rose up early in the church, disclaimed the, the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. Rather, it was a spiritual, ghost-like resurrection. And Paul makes clear in 1 Corinthians 15, and there's elsewhere, that uh, Jesus did physically rise from the dead. If he did not physically rose from, rise from the dead, then we cannot be certain that our sins were forgiven. Because while Christ died for our sins, death is the sentence for sin. And since he was sinless and died for our sins, he then should have risen from the grave. And that is the only assurance that we have that we too will find a resurrection for ourselves. So if you ever hear a group or a person talking about resurrection in terms that was not physical, you need to, to run away from that teaching because it is the traditional teaching, the core teaching, even the Apostles' Creed, that uh, Jesus physically rose from the grave. And so John was particularly aiming his arguments, his description of the resurrection appearances, uh, toward proving um, that Jesus did rise from the grave. That's what uh, makes sense this different than the other gospel writers. So we begin now with chapter 20 of uh, John, uh, Gospel of John. And I'll begin and I'll have one of my partners interrupt and, and read uh, where I leave off. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now the thing that we need to look at in that first part of that description is that it sounds similar to some of the descriptions found in 
uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Except there's some differences like the number of people or the number of women that went to the tomb. Or what those other women saw. And this is focused basically upon Mary Magdalene. And though it says that she went to the tomb, uh, it doesn't mean that she went to the tomb alone. And the reason I can say that is that um, it says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we, plural, don't know where they have put him. So it wasn't just her report. She's reporting to Peter and also John, the author of this gospel, because John refers to himself maybe through a sign of humility, but he refers to himself as the, gospel, as the disciple Jesus loved. And uh, that's a, a wonderful thing. We talked about that last week, to be able to refer to yourself as the, as the disciple that Jesus loved. It doesn't mean that John felt that uh, he was loved more than the other disciples, but it's more of an expression of his own devotion for Jesus. He loved Jesus dearly. We find it the description of the Last Supper that it was John who was laying close to Jesus and even leaning on Jesus. John was part of the inner circle. Uh, John was also the one after the crucifixion in which all of a sudden Jesus, as he was hanging on the cross, one of his final statements, he looked at John and he said to John, Behold your mother. And to then his mother, he said, Behold your son. He was then conveying to John the responsibility of caring for his mom. We find that tradition has that, that John did just that. After he fled from Jerusalem, from the persecution there, he went to Ephesus. He became the leader, the overseer of the churches in Asia. And so what he did is he took up his residence in Ephesus. He took Mary, we believe, with him. There is an Ephesus to this day, a, ca a cathedral, a small cathedral or small church that is named after Mary. It is believed that that's where she lived out the rest of her life and where she also died. So that's the reason why John calls himself you know, the beloved one that, Je that Jesus loved. But we also see that Mary was not the only one to witness the empty tomb. The others ran off, they were afraid, and, and they also eventually went and told other disciples because the disciples were not all in one place at first, and then later did come together. So that's the explanation behind that. But they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So she did not realize that he had been risen from the grave, only that someone had removed his body. Any questions from the group that's with me that uh, regarding that description of those few verses? Charlie, how about if you would read um, up until verse 9, starting with verse 3. Peter, Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. He also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other clothes, but was folded up in its own place. The other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. The disciples returned to the place where they were staying. So we find their description. I remember on Easter Sunday morning, I sang a song uh, that was that description of Mary coming to Peter. It uh, was written by Don Franciscus and uh, described how Peter ran to the tomb and John ran ahead. And we can understand that because John was the youngest of the disciples. And uh, as I've gotten older, I know I can't run so fast either. But uh, <coughs> the detail of this also gives us reason to have confidence in the truthfulness 
of the description. Details given. Mary came. Bodies missing. We don't know where they have taken them. She didn't realize that it was resurrection. The other women stayed at the tomb frightened, and they had an encounter, so the other gospel, uh, gospel writer said, with angels outside the tomb, and went in and checked out the inside, and had the message of the resurrection. Mary didn't have that, apparently. She came and just told Peter and John that the body's missing. And so uh, they then broke out of their house and out of their seclusion for their own protection and ran to the tomb. John refers to himself as the other disciple. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say that it's himself. He just says, it just says the other disciple. And the one who Jesus loves. Yes. 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 So then we come to verse 10, in which then the disciples went back to their homes. So all of a sudden they went and saw the tomb. They saw that it was empty, and they returned home. But Mary did not return home with them. And this is what it describes there. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying because for all she knew at that point in time was that the body was missing. And um, that was very important to have that body and know where Jesus was. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. So two angels. I described for us yet last week how it is uh, by tradition, by law, that something cannot be proved legally unless there are, uh, it's based upon the testimony of two or three witnesses. So we find that there are two angels that are here. And um, so she wept, she saw the, uh, the two angels, and then they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she responded, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. So you find that Mary sees two angels, maybe not even recognizing them as angels, and they ask, why are you crying? They don't really give her an answer. Instead, uh, she, she turns around and sees Jesus. But she didn't realize it was Jesus. Now we have to ask ourselves the question, what prevented Mary from realizing that it was Jesus that was standing before her. Well, one thing is she didn't expect to see him there. So when she saw a person there, she wasn't even thinking about Jesus at the time. Okay. And we don't know whether his uh, figure had changed, you know, whether there was something different about him. Okay. So just the fact that he was that he she didn't expect to see him, okay. then she didn't recognize him. Okay. So the first reason is that they didn't expect it. I mean, how many of us have been to a funeral or how many of us have visited someone at the grave and were surprised to find uh, the person that died being there? <laughs> is this not something you go and expect? And so that's understandable. Uh, another aspect might have been her own grief. Uh, when you're in grief, you do not see clearly. I don't necessarily mean with your eyes, but you don't perceive clearly. But her eyes were probably clouded from the tears. Exactly. She was crying. That's the description it had. And so she was grieving. So that grief took up, uh, predominated in her thinking. And so then the lack of expectation. Uh, the third uh, understanding may be that Jesus appeared differently. Obviously, um, though they cleaned his body, they wrapped it hastily before placing it in the tomb, um, it would have borne the wounds, and they would have been weeping wounds. It would not have been um, a very clean sight. It's one reason why the women went back three days later after the Sabbath and such, so they could better clean up and embalm the body as to their tradition. And what would he have been wearing? 
because That's true. he, you know, recognized him and thinking he was a gardener, so he must have been wearing something other than being what he left behind in the tomb. I mean, he took all the wrappings from around him, so they weren't there. Yep, and he so would he have had his clothes that was gambled for by the <laughs> by the guards. Um, so you know, it is it is a, a part of the mystery. Obviously, he was clothed in something. Obviously, it was clean. While we know he still had wounds, like he showed Thomas the wounds in his hand, offered him to see the scar on his side, they weren't weeping, they weren't bleeding, they were not, you know, they, um, uh, and he was clean. It was not the way they had left him. Well, and he, they wouldn't have expected him to be in clothing that wasn't what they were accustomed to seeing him in. Mm -hmm. So he saw someone sitting there that looked like a gardener. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you know, she wouldn't be anticipating that it was Christ. That's very, very true. So we find that there's a mystery there. We're not always supposed to know all the exact details. We don't need to know. The only thing that the gospel writers provide us uh, for their purposes, uh, that God would call them to do, is give us what we need to know. And that's important when we study the word. Uh, Woman, so this man said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? And of course, Jesus would have known. Now, why do you think he asked her who you are looking for? Why didn't you just say, Mary, here I am. Don't cry. He wanted to see what she had to say. Okay. You know, sometimes our realization of divine truth is comes in a process. It's not like a snap. It's not like an all of a sudden, ah, it's an epiphany. I mean, there's certainly an epiphany in it, but sometimes there's a process to our realizing the truth, and that's important for us to realize. And sometimes we got the Holy Spirit asks us questions, but they're rhetorical questions as far as what the Holy Spirit or God has, but they're, they're asked in a rhetorical sense because it's important for us to be able to give the answer that God thinks should have been obvious to us because it had only been foretold them that he would suffer and die and rise on the third day. And so, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. At that, he realized that she still didn't have that epiphany, that awareness of what had happened. And so he then says to her, calls her by name, Mary. As she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my Father and to your Father to my God and your God. So she, Jesus gave her instructions. Right now there's a purpose. Don't hold on to me. And if I was theologically preach on this, there are times when we hold on to our faith and our belief in Jesus. And our belief may be correct. But instead we hold on to it for our own purposes, for our own benefit. Instead, our belief is not just for our own benefit. Our faith is not just for our own benefit. Yes, our faith is that which saves us, that heals us. But it's not just for our own benefit, but our faith is given to us so it might benefit others. That others might find salvation, that others might find healing, that others might find the way of life. And so he interrupted her, don't hold on to me. You could take that as meaning she was grabbing hold of him. Out of her grief, she may have grabbed hold of him once he, once he called her name. I think back in, in also earlier, in, when, in chapter 15, I believe it is, in which Jesus talked about being the shepherd of the sheep. He says the shepherd speaks forth the name of the sheep, and the sheep recognize his voice. And so as soon as he said, Mary, 
she not only realized it was Jesus because he knew her name, but she could also recognize his voice. Well, she probably touched him because she wanted to know whether she was hallucinating or not. True. Whether there was really somebody there. So here's a question for you. How do you know when Jesus is speaking to you? In your thoughts, in your head, in reading the word, in gleaning some truth out of it, how do you know when Jesus is speaking to you? It's not just your own thoughts, as Bonnie said. Not necessarily hallucination, but we can confuse our voice, our inner voice, with that of God's. How do we know? That's a difficult question, isn't it? I think you feel it inside of you when something hits. You feel it inside of you. Okay. Well, when it's something that you would think that, yes, that's the kind of thing that Jesus would ask of us. Okay. You know, it's not something outrageous. It's something that we should do. So in other words, um, how we discern, one of the ways we discern um, that God speaking to us or Jesus speaking to us is the Holy Spirit. Um, there's that intuition, there's that sense that only comes from walking and knowing Jesus. See, the only way we are able to recognize Jesus' voice speaking to us every day is when we have trained ourselves to listen to Jesus. That's the importance of prayer. Prayer is not just our speaking our requests in Jesus' name. It's also listening. And we also listen by being acquainted with his word. They didn't have the written word, except for the Old Testament, at this time. But that's what Jesus also shared with, in the Gospel of Luke, with the two persons, disciples that were traveling to Emmaus. He explained the word to them, because Jesus speaks to us through the word. He reminded them several times, we read in the Gospels, uh, of what was going to happen to him. So what happened is they needed to remember. So we listen and we hear Jesus through the word and what God has already revealed. And if all of a sudden something that's said to us that doesn't is not consistent with the word that's already been revealed, we can call it into question. So I can determine whether it's as best as I can whether it's just my inner longings, my hopes, or whether it's really Jesus speaking. No, her hopes were fulfilled. She got to see Jesus. She got to grow, to grab hold of her master, her teacher. And, but it wasn't just for her. You gotta let me go, because I got something for you to do. Go tell my disciples that I am returning to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. I love that expression. I am returning, not that I have returned. I am returning to my Father and your Father. So all of a sudden there's a change in relationship. By knowing Jesus, Jesus' Father, Heavenly Father, becomes our Father. And Jesus' God is our God. <coughs> so there's already been a connection of faith. We are with God. That which separated us from God, our sin, has been torn away and forgiven. And now we have access. God is our Father. Um, Jesus is our God. And so that's an important expression there. Mary Magdalene, so we know which Mary it is, went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. Now it's not, I have seen the empty tomb. That's what she went and said first. The tomb was empty. <coughs> they took his body. We don't know where it is. This time she came to them and said, I have seen the Lord. I haven't seen his body. I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that, she, that he had said these things to her. Now, um, we have um, the rest of that, in which on the evening that the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, 
for the door is locked for fear of the Jews. We have to realize they were separated from pu the public because they feared that what happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. So they locked themselves uh, behind doors. Where the doors were, where were they residing, we don't really know. Uh, some speculate that it was the upper room where they had taken the Last Supper. Uh, others you know, would say they, there are other followers of Jesus, not just the 12 apostles, but other disciples we know that were following behind them. Some were from Jerusalem. Some might have opened their doors for them. So that's where they were. Uh, but they were with the doors for fear of the Jews. They were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, So at this time, the 12 got together. They probably got together, or the 11, not the 12, because Judas is missing, of course. Uh, they got together uh, because of these reports. What are we going to do about this? What are we going to say about this? And so um, Jesus showed himself behind the locked doors. Now, this is a physical body, right? Physical resurrection. She was able to hold on to him. But yet, locked doors couldn't keep him out. Somehow he could translate from outside, inside, or somehow be in that same room with them in a physical form. And, and appear before them. And he said, Peace be with you. Okay. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Of course they would. Of course they would. And peace means your fears, let them subside. Your worries, let them subside. Be at rest. Um, have confidence in God. Um, so then Jesus again said, Peace be with you. He reminded them a second time. Peace be with you. Okay. Peace is gradual. Sometimes peace can be instantaneous. All of a sudden we experience the truth of God and God's presence and God's love for us and it's immediate. There's a sense of peace. Sometimes our worries prevail against us and dominate us. We struggle with our fears and our worries and our doubts, our doubts as well. And we're not at peace, really, until those things have been dealt with. And so Jesus then, after showing them evidence, then says again, peace. Let it go. Let it go. Trust in me. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, this is interesting. The Gospel of John does not have the ascension of Jesus. Now, at the, before his ascension, he met the disciples. And where did he meet them? Do you remember? Was it in Jerusalem? Galilee. It was in Galilee. Jerusalem. Okay. And then what did he say to his disciples? Some of us probably said a lot of things, but one of his closing statements, uh, what were one of his closing statements? We call it the Great Commission. Okay. I have been given authority. Okay. I extend that authority to you. Now go into all the world and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have taught you now that was in Galilee this is in Jerusalem doesn't it sound very similar as the Father has sent me I am sending you now the, the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet Holy Spirit didn't come until when? Pentecost, which was 50 days later after his, his death and resurrection. Okay? That's the next holy days that we are to celebrate, Pentecost, in which all of a sudden the Holy Spirit descended upon the, the disciples 
the disciples had the boldness to leave the locked doors, go out and preach the gospel, the truth about who Jesus was. And then thousands came to trust in Jesus and have faith. So something powerful had happened. But here, John combines them. He says, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But yet the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet until Pentecost. So what do we have here? Well, it shows us again that we can't take, have trust in the word. So what would be the answer to that, to the skeptic saying, see, this is only evidence you can't believe what you're reading. What would be your answer to that? Well, he would just, he was probably prophesying that the Holy Spirit was going to be with them okay. in his place. Okay. Because what he ascended after 40 days and Pentecost was what, 50 days? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was coming, he knew it was coming, and he kind of commissioned them to accept the Holy Spirit. What happens here is that it's explainable in realizing that John is not giving uh, and doesn't feel it's necessary for his hearers to hear about the ascension of Jesus. Okay. And Pentecost, they already knew about. Okay. His, his intention was to give about the resurrection. And so what he does is he gives a summarization, a snapshot of the great, what we call the Great Commission right here okay he's meeting with the disciples he gives them the great commission go um and you have the holy spirit and he also is reiterating something that he said earlier that when he was alive with his disciples that um you must forgive sin in order to be forgiven and he also told them um for peter particularly uh, he says i give and the other 11 i have given you the keys to the kingdom. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And what that means basically, when we say, Charlie, your sins are forgiven. They're forgiven. And what happens if I withhold forgiveness, all of a sudden you go through your life and you may doubt whether you're forgiven. You may continue to struggle with your sins because no one else believes that you're forgiven. And there, it's called absolution. There's power in absolution. And that's what we have the power of being able to give to some person who has done wrong um, and uh, they're hurting because of the wrong that they have done. We're able to say, hey, you're forgiven. Those are powerful words that we say to another person. It can break the chains. It isn't the fact that they haven't been forgiven. But sometimes we can't be freed from our sins until we know that someone else also, someone tangible, someone physical, says to us, you're forgiven. But you also have to forgive yourself. That's correct. And you know, John is writing this from 60 years after it all happened. That's right. So the, the minute details aren't important. He's just saying what principles Jesus was sending out that's correct. That's correct. Now we've got, uh, we're going to finish chapter 20. We'll go into 21 next week. But uh, I'm going to have, Charlie, if you would read from verse 24. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we'd seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my fingers in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, his side I won't believe. After eight days, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. He said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas was responding to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll, but things that are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, believing you will have life in his name. 
John gives us his purpose for writing right there. His purpose was that so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the whole purpose of why he is writing this. That was one of the purposes, the major purpose of why he's writing this. And what's so important about this description is that Thomas is also mentioned elsewhere in Luke, um, that uh, didn't believe. He wasn't with the disciples in that room at first. So he wasn't privy. He was somewhere else, whether he was grieving or he chose to be in another house with some other disciples. Um, so he wasn't there. And then all of a sudden when he found his other brothers, um, they shared that they had seen the Lord. He had come into the, the room, the house where they were staying. But he didn't believe it. Why was Thomas referred to as the twin? Well, that's that's a, a good question. Um, uh, there's been a lot of different speculation on that. One is that he he was it was a twin physically. Okay. Another is that he was a twin in that he had both sides. He was a believer and he was filled with doubt. Okay. Sometimes um, we are. Um, broken by our doubts. We want to believe, and we do believe, but then we're plagued by our doubts. And we find that because of these doubts, we waver back and forth. We're almost like divided persons, you know? Um, and uh, that might be also a description of what, you know, why he was called the twin. Um, but uh, the most natural one is that he was a twin. So he was the one that followed. Jesus, not the other. Um, we find that all of a sudden the importance of Thomas being there and then having seen the nail prints and the wounds in the side, of course the others could see that too. But in realizing what I've just what I've said earlier regarding the intention of John in his writing, why was this particular description, which is not found elsewhere, in the other Gospels. Why was this so important to include for John? Well, because it said that, you know, Thomas doubted until he saw physical proof. Okay. And it's important that people that have not seen these things still believe. Okay. So we, uh, I said that John um, was writing against a heresy called Gnosticism, which questioned the resurrection and questioned that Jesus had a real physical body, but a spiritual I, body. I, so I, this was proof that he had a physical body. I think that may have been why the 11 disciples were hesitant to get out and, and disciple and act, because they were waiting for enough physical proof so that they wouldn't be confronted with the authorities outside the door as, as strongly. They needed some kind of <laughs> statements from some other people. Now, now, I think that's a very important statement that you made, Charlie, because imagine that. What causes our reluctance to boldly share our belief in Jesus? What other people might think. What other people are going to think. Okay. And because we have some doubts, we're duplicitous, he says, Thomas the twin, um, duplicitous um, in our attitude or understanding. We, we want to believe, we believe, but we have doubts. And so we are <coughs> less willing to risk taking that risk taking that risk because our doubts get the best of us. Mm -hmm. They then didn't have doubt because they actually had it better than we did. Because they have and saw the, the physical resurrection and they had, of Jesus. Well, yeah, they had, they had his teachings beforehand, but they knew that outside that door was mm -hmm. uncertain. Uncertainty. I think Thomas's experience probably enhanced the other disciples' experience too, mm -hmm. because they may have had a little bit of doubt, but here was Thomas actually touching the wound yeah. and having it reinforced in his mind, and he accepted it. And some of the other people that might have been a little bit leery about what was going on, that kind of made it good for them too. You know, it's good for us when we see someone who has had great doubts and struggle with their faith. All, all of a sudden, in a transformative moment, um, give up their doubts 
And if they doubted, and their doubts were more pronounced than our own, but they believed, doesn't that give us more reassurance of the truth? You know, we hear stories of people who have um, fallen into great sin. But then we also hear their great transformation. Our transformation not, may not be as obvious, may not be as dramatic, but the, but the wonderful blessing that we gain from those dramatic stories is that they reinforce to us, in order for this change to have happened, this has to be true. So that's why it's important. Now what's also important he says to Thomas, no, Thomas comes back and says, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God, you're real, right? Then Jesus tells him, and this is not just for him. This was not just for the disciples at this time. This is for you and me. He says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John was writing an audience that was 60 years you know, away from the resurrection, okay? Mm -hmm. And they didn't see the physical resurrection, but they believed. You think they had doubts at times? And he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now that also speaks to you and me because I haven't seen, and I don't think you have, um, ever seen the resurrected Jesus Christ and yet we believe blessed are we when we believe even though we haven't seen faith is not sight right it's insight but not necessarily sight and you and I have to make the decision to believe based on the witness and the evidences that we are given and that needs to be enough. And the, the further proof of that resurrection is the Holy Spirit. That's why he says he breathed on them and he said receive the Holy Spirit. That means they had a choice to receive the Holy Spirit or not receive the Holy Spirit. And you and I have the choice to believe and to receive the Holy Spirit. We choose to believe or not believe. In the midst of our doubts, and most of us, if we're honest, will admit that we have doubts. I'm giving thanks of faith. We have doubts. But we have a choice. I'm going to believe, <clears throat> or I'm not going to believe. It's not automatic. We choose to believe. And if we believe, then we can also believe Jesus' promise, receive the Holy Spirit. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, I choose to receive the Holy Spirit, meaning I believe that Jesus can, can communicate to me right now as clearly and discernibly be present in my life as he was with those disciples. That's a real challenge. Do we believe? You know, repeatedly in this description, there was Jesus saying, peace be with you. So we have the choice of whether we're going to be at peace. We will only be at peace when we, say, when we choose to believe. We will only be at peace when we choose to receive the Holy Spirit, that inner confirmation that Jesus calls us by name, that Jesus is alive and real. And then we can know peace. If we don't settle that and make that decision, we never, never will have deep inner peace. That's what we're going to cover for today, because that's sufficient for today. We invite you to join us this next Wednesday, um, and we'll begin looking at John chapter 21. Would you have prayer with me? Dear Jesus, we believe you are, you are alive. We believe the testimony and the witnesses that have been given to us, that they are true. And we choose to believe. We choose to follow you by faith. 
we choose right now to ask your Holy Spirit to come and enter us to give us the assurance of the things that we question that they are true and that we know that you will reveal yourself to us as we follow you in faith. And we thank you for the gifts that you provide for us, particularly the gift of your word, the gift of your Holy Spirit, and the gift of the fellowship we share. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.